Chapter 8 Omri gaped at him. He hadn't thought of this, but of course now that he did, it was obvious. No boy who knew the secret could possibly rest until he had a little live person of his own. Patrick, it's not like you think. Just something to play with. Of course not. You've explained all about it. Now, just let me put... But you have to think about it first. No, no, stop. You can't yet. And anyway, I don't agree to you using one of mine. Omri didn't know why he was so reluctant. It wasn't that he was mean. He just knew, somehow, that something awful would happen if he let Patrick have his own way. But it wasn't easy to stop him. Omri had grabbed him, but he wrenched free. I've got to, he panted. I've got to. He stretched out his hand toward the pile of soldiers again. They struggled. Patrick seemed to have gone a bit crazy. Suddenly, Omri felt the rim of the tin plate under his shifting feet. He shoved Patrick out of the way, and they both stared downward. The plate had tipped. The fire slipped off onto the carpet. Little Bear, with a yell, had leapt clear and was now waving his arms and shouting horrible things at them. His roast meat had disappeared under Omri's foot, which instinctively stamped down on the fire to put it out. He felt a squishy feeling under his shoe. Now look, we've spoiled the meat, he shouted at Patrick. If all you can do is fight, I wish I'd never brought you. Patrick, Patrick looked mulish. It was your fault. You should have let me put something in the cupboard. Omri lifted his shoe. Underneath was a nasty mess of burned stuff, squashed meat, and bent erector set. Little Bear let out a wail. You no great spirit. Only stupid boy. Fight. Spoil good meal. You feel shame. Maybe we can rescue it. He crouched down and disentangled the meat from the mess, burning his fingers. He had tried to brush it clean, but it was no use. It was all mixed up with the smelly stuff of the fire lighter and stuck with bits of carpet hairs. I'm terribly sorry, little bear, he mumbled. No good sorry. Little bear hungry. Work all day. Cook meat. Now what eat? I chop you down like tree. And to Omri's horror, he saw little bear run to where the battle axe was lying, pick it up and advance toward his leg, swinging it in great circles as he came. Patrick fairly danced with excitement. Isn't he fantastically brave, though? Much more than David with Goliath. Omri felt the whole thing was going too far. He removed his leg from harm's way. Little Bear, calm down, he said. I've said I'm sorry. Little Bear looked at him, blazing-eyed. Then he rushed over to the chair Omri used at his table and began chopping wedges out of the leg of it. Stop, stop! or I'll put you back in the cupboard. Little Bear stopped abruptly and dropped the ax. He stood with his back to them, his shoulders heaving. I'll get you something to eat right now, something delicious. Go and paint. I'll make you feel better. It'll make you feel better. I won't be long. To Patrick, he said, hang on, I can smell supper cooking. I'll go and get a bit of whatever we're having and he rushed downstairs without stopping to think. His mother was dishing up a nice hot stew. Can I have a tiny bit of that, Mum? Just a little bit, in a spoon? It's for a game we're playing. His mother obligingly gave him a big spoonful. Don't let it drip, she said. Does Patrick want to stay for supper? I don't know, I'll ask, said Omri. Were you fighting up there? I heard thumps. No, not really. It was just that we wanted to do something that I... Omri stopped dead as if frozen on the ground. He might have been frozen. His face went so cold. Patrick was up there with the cupboard and two biscuit tinfuls of little plastic figures. Alone. Omri ran. He usually won the egg and spoon race at the school sports, which was just as well. It's hard enough to carry an egg in a spoon running along a flat field. It's a great deal harder to carry a tablespoon of boiling hot stew steady while you rush up a flight of stairs. If most of it was still there when he got to the top, it was more by luck, by good luck, 
than skill because he was hardly noticing the spoon at all. All he could think of was what might be no, must be happening in his room and how much more of it would happen if he didn't hurry. He burst in through the door and saw exactly what he'd dreaded. Patrick bent over the cupboard, just turning the key to open it. What? Omri gasped out between panting breaths, but he had no need to go on. Patrick, without turning around, opened the cupboard and reached in. Then he did turn. He was gazing into his cupped hands with eyes like huge marbles. He slowly extended his hands toward Omri and whispered, Look! Omri, stepping forward, had just time to feel intensely glad that at least Patrick had not put a whole handful of figures in, but had only changed one. But which? He leaned over, then drew back with a gasp. It was the cowboy and his horse. The horse was in absolute panic. It was scrambling about wildly in the cup of Patrick's hands, snorting and pawing, up one minute and down on its side the next, stirrups and reins flying. It was a beautiful horse, snow white with a long mane and tail, and the sight of it acting so frightened gave Omri heart pains. As for the cowboy, he was too busy dodging the horse's flying feet and jumping out of the way when it fell to notice much about its, his surroundings. He probably thought he was caught in an earthquake. Omri and Patrick watched, spellbound, as the little man in his plaid shirt, buckskin trousers, high-heeled leather boots, and big hat scrambled frantically up the side of Patrick's right arm and, dodging through the space between his index finger and thumb, swung himself clear of the horse, only to look down and find he was dangling over empty space. His hat came off and fell slowly like a leaf, down, down, down to the floor, so indefinitely far below. The cowboy gave a yell and scrambled with his feet against the back of Patrick's hand, hanging on for dear life to the ridge beside his thumbnail. Hold your hands still, Omri commanded Patrick, who in his excitement was jerking them nervously about. There was a moment of stillness. The horse stood up, trembling all over, prancing about with terror. Beside his hooves was some tiny black thing. Omri peered closer. It was the pistol. The cowboy had now recovered a little. He scrambled back through the finger gap and said something to the horse that sounded like, whoa, back, steady, fella. Then he slid down and grabbed the reins, holding them just below the horse's nose. He patted his face. That seemed to calm it. Then, looking around, swiftly, but not apparently noticing the enormous faces hanging over him, he reached cautiously down and picked the pistol up from between the horse's hooves. Whoa there! Stand! Omri watched like a person hypnotized. He wanted to cry out to Patrick that it was a real gun, but somehow he couldn't. He could only think that the sound of his voice would throw the horse once more into a panic, and that horse or man would get hurt. Instead, he watched while the cowboy pointed the gun in various directions warily. Then he lowered it. Still holding the reins, he moved until he could press his hand against Patrick's skin. Then he let his eyes move upward toward the curved arms just level with the top of his head. Gone heck, he said. It sure looks like a great big... Ah... What am I talking about? It can't be. Who just can't? Ain't possible. But the more he looked, the more certain he must have become that he was, indeed, in a pair of cupped hands. And finally, after scratching his ginger, gingery head for a moment, he ventured to look right up past the fingers. And then, of course, he saw Patrick's face looking at him. There was a petrified moment when he couldn't move. Then he raised his pistol in a flash. Patrick, shut your eyes! Bang! It was only a little bang, but it was a real bang, and a puff of real gun-smelling smoke appeared. Patrick shouted with pain and surprise and would have dropped the pair if Omri hadn't thrust his hand underneath to catch them. Patrick's own hand had clapped itself to his cheek. Ow! Ow! He shot me! Patrick screamed. Omri was much 
was not much bothered about Patrick at that moment. He was furious with him and very anxious about the little man and his horse. Quickly, he put them down on the bed, saying, like the cowboy himself, Steady! Whoa! I won't hurt you! It's okay! Ow! Patrick kept yelling. It hurts! Ow! Serves you right! I warned you, said Omri. Then he felt sorry and said, Let's have a look. Gingerly, Patrick took his hand down. A drop of blood had been smeared on his cheek, and by peering very close, Omri could see something very like a bee's stinger embedded in his skin. Hang on, I see it. I'll squeeze it out. Ow! A quick squeeze between his thumbnails and the almost invisible speck of black metal, which had only just penetrated the skin, popped out. He, he shot me, Patrick got out again in a shocked voice. I told you. My Indian stuck a knife in me, said Omri, not to be outdone. I think we ought to put him back. Your cowboy, I mean. Of course, not my Indian. Put him back where? Omri explained how the cupboard could change him back to plastic again. But Patrick wasn't having any of that. Oh, no, I want him. He's terrific. Look at him now. Patrick feasted his eyes admiringly on the little cowboy, who, ignoring the giants, whom he clearly thought he must have imagined, was doggedly dragging his horse across Omri's quilt as if he were wading through the dunes of some infinite pale blue desert. Omri reached for him determinedly, but Patrick stepped into his path. Don't you touch him. I bought him. I changed him. He's mine. You bought him for me. You said you didn't want him. Well, but the cupboard's mine, and I told you not to use it. And so what if I did? Anyway, it's done. He's alive now, and I'm keeping him. I'll bash you right in if you try to take him. Wouldn't you bash me if I took your Indian? Omri was silent. He reminded him, it re that reminded him. Where was Little Bear? He looked around. He soon spotted him at the other side of the room, busy with his paints. Some beautiful, minute designs showing turtles, herons, and beavers, mainly in red and yellow. He appeared on the side of had appeared on the side of the teepee Omri had made. As Omri crouched beside him to admire them, Little Bear, without looking at him, said, You bring food? I very soon die, if not eat. Omri looked around. What had he done with the spoonful of stew? But he soon saw that he'd put it down on the table without thinking. There it sat, tilting slightly and spilling a few drops of gravy, but still steaming. He hurried to get Little Bear's, or rather, Action Man's, mess tin plate. The paper plate had got all soggy, and carefully filled it with the hot, savory stuff. Here you are. Little Bear stopped work, laid down his paintbrush, and sniffed eagerly. Ah, good, he sat down, cross-legged among the paint, paint lids to eat dipping some of yesterday's stale bread in as a spoon. Your wife cook? Ah, uh, no. Little Bear forgot. Omri not got wife. He ate ravenously for a few moments and then said, Not want? I'm having mine downstairs in a minute, Omri said. Mean Omri not want wife, said Little Bear, who was now in a much better mood. I'm not old enough. Little Bear looked at him for a moment. No, I see. Boy, he grinned. Big boy, but boy. He went on eating. Little Bear want, he said, finally not looking up. Another wife? Chief need wife. Want one beautiful, good cook. He put his face into the mess tin and licked it clean. Then he looked up. With Iroquois, mother find wife for son. But little bear mother not here. Omri be mother and find. Omri couldn't quite see himself as little bear's mother, but he said, I might try. I think, there's, are, I think there were some lady Indians in Yaps, but what if I get one and make her real and then you don't like her? I like, you get. Tomorrow, little bear grinned 
at him happily, his face smeared with gravy. Patrick had come up behind him. Let's put them together and see what they do. Omri jumped up quickly. No! Why not? You idiot! Because yours has got a gun and mine's got a bow and arrow, and one of them's sure to kill the other. Patrick considered this. Well, we could take their weapons away from them. Come on! I'm going to. And he reached toward the bed. Just at that moment, there was the sound of steps on the stairs. They froze. Then Omri swiftly moved the dressing up crate enough to hide Little Bear and Patrick sat down on the end of the bed, masking the poor cowboy, who was still toiling along over the humps in the quilt. Just in time, Omri's mother opened the door the next second and said, Patrick, that, you're, that was your mom on the phone. She wants you to come home right away. And Omri, it's supper. And she went. Omri opened his mouth to protest, but Patrick at once said, Oh, okay. With one quick movement, he had scooped up cowboy and horse in his left hand and thrust them into his pocket. Omri winced. He could easily imagine the horse's legs being injured by such a rough treatment, not to mention the matter of fright. But Patrick was already halfway out the door. Omri jumped up and grabbed his arm. Patrick, he whispered. You must be careful. Treat them carefully. They're people. I mean, they're alive. What will you do with them? How will you hide them from your family? I won't. I'll show them to my brother, anyway. He'll go out of his mind. Omri began to think he might go out of his mind. He shook Patrick's arm. Will you think? How are you going to explain? What will happen? If you say you got him from me, I'll do worse than bash you. You'll ruin everything. They'll take the cupboard away. That got through to Patrick at last. He put his hand slowly back into his pocket. Listen then, you can look after them, but remember, they're mine. If you put them back in the cupboard, I'll tell everyone. I'm warning you, I will. Bring them to school tomorrow. To school? cried Omri, aghast. I'm not bringing Little Bear to school. You can do what you like about Little Bear. He's yours. The cowboy's mine, and I want him at school tomorrow. Otherwise, I'll tell. Omri let go of his arm for a, mo for a moment. They looked at each other as if they'd been strangers. But they weren't strangers. They were friends. That counts for a lot in this life. Omri gave in. All right, he said. I'll bring them. Now, give them to me. Gently. And Patrick brought man and horse out of his pocket and tipped them very carefully into Omri's waiting hand.